Hello everyone, we are starting module 8 on synchronization. This is lecture number 1 in which we are going to discuss about uninterruptible instructions. Okay, so uh, let us first understand why we need to synchronize. In the lectures on memory consistency, when we discuss sequential consistency, uh, we observed that sequential consistency was very strict. It did not allow any compiler optimizations. It did not allow us to reorder and that would affect the performance of a single core as well as a multi-core system. So we want the memory consistency model to be weaker. When we go to a weaker model and we still want to satisfy sequential consistency, we decided that we will uh, enclose such set of instructions into a safety net using some fence instructions or barrier instructions or read modify write type of atomic instructions. Okay, so in uh, this module we are going to understand further on this concept of uh, atomically executing an instruction. Apart from sequential consistency uh, or memory consistency in general, even in the context of coherence, coherence only says that at a time one a process can change a particular variable. But in a generic scenario, when multiple processes are accessing one shared variable and it is required that exactly one process is able to use that variable for an extended duration, we need to give exclusive access to this process to that particular shared resource. A uh, popular example is a printer. So if you want to print a task, you cannot allow multiple processes to use the printer. You want one process to first complete its uh, printing task, only then the second process can begin. So this is a shared resource and how do you guarantee exclusive access to a process? Okay, so this is popularly done using mutual exclusion where you access the resource in an exclusive manner then the process enters a critical section, completes the use of the resource and then relinquishes that resource. Okay, so this is uh, the popular concept of synchronization so that exclusive access to one shared resource is established. Right? So we need to synchronize so that shared data as well as resources can be used safely by different processes. Synchronization of course is a more generic and we can't say that if a system is coherent or a system is sequentially consistent, I would not need synchronization. Well, we definitely need synchronization and that it transcends the coherence as well as consistency models. So in spite of the presence of coherence and consistency, we do need synchronization. Okay, so even if my system is sequentially consistent, I will still need synchronization. Okay. So, for example, we have a printer and a shared variable in the memory and that has to be accessed by multiple processes. So, exactly one of them should get access and for this we need to synchronize. How do you enforce this? We normally do this using flags or semaphores. So, this shared variable which is there in the memory, we need to access exclusively. So, if I am using a flag to access to that uh, shared variable. So this flag or something called a synchronization variable is used inside the memory. So we have this variable, I can call it a lock variable and I will gain access over this lock variable so that I get permission to use that resource. So this shared variable or the lock variable or the flag has to be free for us to uh, use the shared resource. If it is not free, then uh, it is derived that there is some other process using that resource. Hence, we need to wait until the resource becomes available. Okay, so this uh, lock variable which is there in the memory, before we want to acquire access, we have to go to this lock variable and then lock it. I mean, is the lock variable free or is it locked? So, we need to establish this and uh, to acquire a lock, we need to go to that location and then set a particular value inside this. Now writing a value into this has to be done atomically. Okay, so we need to do an atomic update of this shared variable. So how do you uh, implement this in hardware? So synchronization uh, mechanisms are definitely there in software and most of these software programs, they rely on hardware supplied instructions. Right? So they rely on the instructions given by the hardware to implement synchronization. Okay, so how much support does the software need? So there has been always a debate that the software should do more and the hardware less and vice versa. Okay, so how much support 
uh, should the hardware give to the software is exactly not known and there has been a debate about who should do more task. Okay? But uh, leaving that apart, we need a generic understanding and that was established by the classic works of Dijkstra and Knuth. So, they observed that it is possible to provide mutual exclusion with only an atomic read modify write type of an instruction. So, if I have a read modify write type of an operation in a memory which is sequentially consistent, then I will be able to provide synchronization. Okay, so, this has to be implemented. So, our job uh, in the hardware is to implement such atomic read modify write type of instructions and all practical implementations rely on such a support from the hardware. Okay, so, no matter whether hardware provides bigger routines or complete routines to establish synchronization or whether software does more of the task, but the bottom line is hardware has to provide some sort of an atomic read modify write operation. And this atomic operation essentially means that you have to first read that variable, modify it and write. So, while you are doing these three actions, they have to be done atomically without intervening accesses from other processes, right. So, there should be no other process which is able to go and modify this variable when one particular process is doing that. So, if we can do this, only then synchronization can be implemented in hardware. All right. So, what are the different options or what are the different options used by the processors? So, uh, this slide lists the different uh, in types of instructions used by variety of real life implementations. The IBM 370 uses compare and swap type of an instruction. So, this instruction is an atomic instruction which goes to the memory location which is the shared lock variable. It goes there, compares that value and swaps that value with its local variable. So, for example, to lock the variable, I need to write a 1 into that lock variable and the lock variable, if it has a value of 0, means the lock variable is free. So, compare and swap, what is it going to do? It is going to go there, check the lock variable. If it is 1, we can't do anything because some other process has already locked it. But if the lock variable is 0, then we need to write a 1 into it. So, we are going to compare whether the value is 0 and if it is 0, we are going to swap that value with a 1. So, I am going to uh, remove the 0 and write a 1 into that location. So, this is the compare and swap instruction. Intel uses a prefix for those instructions which it wants to be executed in an atomic manner. Spark architectures also use swap and compare and swap. Then the MIPS has come up with something new. They do not uh, use a single instruction, but they use a combination of two instructions and uh, which would eventually give us the same effect. Okay. So, we are going to see more details on this. So, it is going to use a special uh, combination of a load and a store to establish the read modify write up type of an operation. And this approach of using two instructions has become more popular and was incorporated by newer systems. Okay. So, synchronization where we want multiple processors to access a shared resource, but before that it has to obtain a lock on the lock variable would become a bottleneck if I have multiple processors and several processes trying to access. So, our uh, task should be or objective should be how do I reduce the contention uh, for this variable? How do I uh, optimize on the latency of obtaining a lock on the system? So, as a designer, you have to keep these things in mind. Okay. So, what are the different components of a synchronization event? So, I can uh, divide it into three parts. One is the acquire, second is the waiting algorithm and the third is the release method. So, acquire is the method where the process tries to get right on the synchronizing variable. So, I want access or control of this lock. So, the lock variable, I want to go and lock it for myself. So, this is the acquire method. When I want to do this, if I do not get the lock, I need some mechanism to keep waiting and checking for this lock. So, that was the waiting algorithm. And third is after I finish using the resource, I need to release the lock that is go to the lock variable and maybe reset it or decrement it depending on the uh, scenario. Okay? So, synchronization is established using 
three major components you need an acquire method you need a waiting algorithm and you need a release method okay so let us see some examples to understand this further so suppose uh, i want to implement a distributed linked list something like this and this linked list is being updated by multiple processes okay running on different processes so if p1 p2 p3 all of them want to add a node to this list at the head position they will create that node and this new node has to become the head node so this is a head pointer so this is the data and this is just a pointer so this pointer variable needs to be changed by these three processes because once they add a new node the head pointer should point to that particular new node so how should they do this so for changing the head pointer they first need access to a lock variable which is our synchronization variable so we will declare a flag or a lock variable in the memory then all three of them will go and try to write a one inside this because uh, zero means the lock variable is free and one means the lock variable is engaged so when p1 wants to uh, add a new node so suppose p1 creates a new data node for itself and now this new node should become the new head pointer so it wants to update the head pointer so it goes to the lock variable and then checks whether it is free or locked if it is free it locks it updates the head pointer and then releases the lock variable same thing will be done by p2 if p1 has already locked that variable and if p3 comes to check it will see that the variable is locked so it will go back and keep waiting until p1 has finished its task when p1 releases the lock p3 will see that the lock is now free and it creates its own new node locks the variable and then updates the head pointer so on this right side you can see a pseudo code for doing this i have multiple processes and when one particular process say pi wants to update the head pointer it first has to acquire the lock okay so for acquiring the lock it has to go to this lock variable and then check whether it is free or engaged and accordingly first obtain a lock onto the system so this is going to take some time okay so this is going to take some time once this is finished then we can enter this area which is called the critical section so here we are going to update the head pointer with the new node once we have finished updating the head pointer you have to unlock the lock variable so that others can start using it okay so this uh, was an example of when do we need synchronization to update the head pointer exclusive access by every process and for that you obtain the lock and then use the code to update the head and then release the lock how do you actually get this lock implemented how do i acquire the lock um, what are the different methods to change the lock variable from 0 to 1 okay so that should be our objective when we understand synchronization from a hardware perspective well if you think can i do this in software software meaning not necessarily high level programs but can i do it in pure assembly using some set of assembly instructions so simple software uh, lock algorithm so here we are going to discuss that if i want to obtain lock on this lock variable what should we do we have to first go to that lock variable read its value if its value is zero then we have to go again to that lock variable and write a one into it now imagine a scenario that there were three processes all three go to the lock variable they read it they get the value as zero okay so if they are all are lucky they will see the value as zero and when they see the value zero they want to go and write the value as one okay so when they write the value of one what has happened all three were able to establish a lock and they all three go into the critical section so which is not desired okay so just having this set of instructions that you go first read the value and then go again later to write the value is not going to be effective okay so what has gone wrong here between the read and the write there has been no communication and it was not atomic and therefore we could not establish the mutual exclusion hence our reading of the lock and setting it to one should be done as an atomic operation and that can be done only in the hardware okay so this is the program where you will load the value of the lock variable if it is not equal to zero that is lock variable has got the value equal to one you go and keep looping right so this is the waiting algorithm so you keep waiting for obtaining the lock 
once you see that the lock variable is zero you go and write a one inside this so you obtain the lock and when you want to release you simply write a zero inside the lock variable so we have a busy wait which waits until we get a value of zero and then we want to set that value to one okay so as discussed two processes can read the value zero into their local registers at the same time so this can be done by say p1 also does this p2 also does this in parallel both of them see the value as zero now both of them have seen the value of zero they will go and write one into it so p1 also tries to write a one and p2 also tries to write a one so p2 also tries to write a one into the lock variable and uh, nobody can stop this from happening because uh, it will be done in a coherent manner but the zero has become a one and uh, it doesn't check what that value was it simply goes and writes a one so both of them will eventually write one and then enter the critical section so this uh, is not satisfying our requirement and why has this happened because we could not do the load and store atomically even if they are two consecutive instructions even if I put them one after the other still we can't guarantee atomicity and therefore we need support from the hardware for atomic instructions like the read modify write type of an instruction. So what are we going to see overall in this topic we are going to look at uninterruptible instructions spin locks point to point event synchronization and global barrier synchronizations. Presently, we will look at the first one of uninterruptible instructions. So, we will begin with an example of test and set. So, test and set is an atomic instruction like read, modify, write, which goes to the location, tests that location, and then sets it to 1. Okay, so this is how it will acquire a lock. Uh, so, I am going to use pseudo assembly code for writing this. So, test and set. So, first, I am going to do write this is the instruction T and S, so test and set lock variable so I have a lock variable I'm going to read this and set it to 1 so R1 I'm assuming that uh, this register R1 has got value of 1 so I'm going to write a 1 into the lock variable and this is the lock where in the memory so we go here we are going to test the value and we are going to write a 1 so when I go I test the value so the re testing value will return the old contents so return the old value into r1 and write a one inside this right so that's also similar to an exchange so the present contents of lock variable will come in the r1 so in case the returned value is one what will you conclude that the lock is not available okay so branch if not zero so if r1 is not zero that is the lock is already locked by somebody what should you do you should keep on trying to acquire the lock okay so i'll just say go branch to try so try is a label in my program which is simply the first instruction so you keep looping in this to acquire the lock once you acquire the lock you can enter the critical section and then you have to unlock so what should you do for unlocking you have to simply write a zero inside that so you'll simply say store lock where value of zero okay so this is the unlock so this is the loop where we are going to wait for the lock this is the critical section and this is the unlock so once you finish the work you have to unlock so uh, we've seen an example of how to use test and set as an atomic instruction so this is instruction implemented in hardware which goes checks the value and writes a one so it does both read and write at the same time okay so a similar code i have written here the only thing is the label is called lock in this so the lock function call will obtain the lock and we'll have an unlock set of instructions which will simply write a zero inside the lock variable okay so i hope you got a flavor of how these uh, instructions look like the test and set so there are more uh, options for this so we have test and set which goes checks the value and writes one into it the second instruction available is fetch an increment so fetch means go read the value 
and whatever is the value increment it and come back. So, fetch and increment as an atomic operation. So, if it is 0 make it 1, if it is 1 make it 2 and so on. Then we have swap instruction which swaps the contents of one register with the lock variable. So, you can uh, load the register with the value you want to lock. For example, I wrote the load the register with 1 and then I swap the register contents with the lock variable to see uh, what was there in the lock variable and if it was 0, I have already written a 1 into it. Okay? So, swap is going to do the same thing like test and set. Okay? And then we have a fourth option which is LL hyphen sc that is load linked store conditional. So, in case implementing single atomic RMW type of an instruction is difficult, we can go for these two instructions which load and store separately, but they guarantee atomicity. Okay? So, these are the different options available for us. Test and set, fetch and increment, different types of swap instructions and load linked and store conditional. So, test and set we have seen one example, fetch and increment would have similar type of a code. So, let us try the swap instruction which is popularly called the exchange instruction. So, here again I want to exchange the value of the lock variable with my register. So, let me say I have this lock var that is in the memory. I have a register um, say R2. And to obtain the lock, I should be writing a 1 into it. So, I will initialize this to 1 and I will say you write this here and you bring this back here. Okay? So, that is the exchange we are going to do. So, to establish this, either you can simply say that initialize R2 to 1 or you can write uh, more fancier instructions. So, I will say add unsigned immediate. So, this is one instruction which adds a value to R0 and the immediate value is equal to 1. So, R0 is a register which has the value of 0. So, if I am taking R0 comma hash 1, it says add 1 to R0 and write it into R2. So, this is the destination. So, in assembly most of the time the first uh, operand here is the destination. So, R2 is the destination inside this what am I writing R0 plus 1. So, R2 will get the value of 1. Once we do this, I will write the atomic instruction exchange. So, this is the instruction name. What am I exchanging? R2 and I am exchanging R2 with the lock var. Okay? So, that is shown in the picture. So, this is what we are doing. Once we do this, what should we do? Uh, the exchange has already written a 1 into R2, but what was there inside the lock variable has come back into R2. If it was 0, we can move on. If it was 1, we should not be allowed to uh, obtain the lock. Okay? So, we have to keep trying. So, I will say try again or try again. When should we keep trying? If the R2's current contents after the exchange is equal to 1. So, branch if not 0 that is the lock was not 0. So, check R2 if R2 was not 0 you can go to the try label. Okay? So, this is how we can use exchange as an instruction to acquire the lock. So, branch if not equal to 0. So, BNZ is also same as BN ez okay they are same instructions all right so we've seen exchange now i will discuss the concept of that waiting algorithm so waiting algorithm was going to check the value of variable so you do an exchange and then after you do the exchange you are want to uh, check what value was there in the lock variable so if i have a system where there is only the memory Okay, there is no cache. Then your exchange instruction which I wrote in this previous slide. So, this exchange instruction, it goes to the memory's lock variable and simply does the exchange. Exchange actually means it does a write to that system. Okay. So, when I am doing a write to that variable, what is happening in a multi-core system and in the presence of caches, you are going to generate lot of invalidations. So, all the other copies will get invalidated and unnecessary bus traffic and invalidations will happen because of our decision of exchanging. So, what can I do? Most of the time, I want to first read the value of the lock variable 
if it is 0 only then I want to make it 1. So, can I divide this task into two pieces? Let me first check the log variable. If it is free, only then I will try to exchange. Okay, so this solves the problem of unnecessary invalidations and it also helps me to spin on my local variable. So, this log variable I have brought already into my cache because I am going to only read the variable. I am not going to exchange. I will go read the log variable. If it is free, then I go and try to exchange the value. Okay, so I have these three processes and in the cache of this process, I will do a read on the lock variable. The idea is that uh, we use locality concept that is if a process tries to acquire a lock, it will again try to acquire the lock uh, in near future. So, it is good to cache the lock variable. Most of the time you are going to get cache hits on this variable. So, you first do a read on the lock variable, bring the variable in your cache and keep checking it because if it was 1, it will remain 1 until somebody changes it. So, if you read this value as 1, there will be somebody else who is using this lock. When that process releases the lock, it is going to write a 0 to this lock variable. So, when it writes a 0, it is going to send an invalidation to all the caches which will then uh, remove this variable from their cache. Okay? So, suppose this is the one which is currently owner of the lock. And when I do a read on the lock, we get the value as 1. Why? Because the yellow process has already acquired the lock. When the yellow process finishes and it executes a release, what will it do? It writes a 0. So, it has to write a 0 inside this lock variable and that 0 will be sent to the memory and invalidations will be sent onto the bus to all the processes. So, this invalidation will remove this variable from these caches. Okay. Next time when the green process again tries to loop that is check the lock variable, it will again issue a read on the lock variable. It will incur a cache miss because the variable was deleted. So, it goes onto the bus to the memory and then fetches the latest value. Very luckily it would get the value as 0 and it will then execute the exchange to lock that variable. Okay? So, there will be definitely a race among the processors to acquire the lock. So, for example, green and pink both want to acquire the lock. So, both of them will want to go into the bus to the main memory to write a 1 into the lock variable. But one of them will succeed because either it is a directory coherence protocol or a bus based coherence protocol, there is serialization and exactly one process will succeed in writing a uh, 1 to that particular copy and definitely other copies will get invalidated. Subsequent reads by the other processes will show that the value is equal to 1 and they will have to keep waiting. Okay? So, this is how we can spin on a local cached copy. Spinning on a cached copy means keep reading the value and when you see the value as 1, just keep reading your local 1 until your local copy shows that the value is equal to 0. Okay? So, you keep reading and once you see the value was equal to 0, then you try to exchange. Exchange is a write operation and exactly one of them will succeed. So, most of the time when we are spinning, so this spinning uh, time is saving the performance because if we had only done exchange, then every exchange would have invalidated all the copies continuously. Right? So, we are saving on these invalidations by uh, spinning on my locally cached variable. Okay, so, how do I implement this using the exchange instruction? So, let us see that. So, we want to spin on our local copy, load the value. So, I will say lock where I want to read this lock variable into my register. So, load. So, I will say load lock where in R2. So, lock where's value will come and sit in the register R2 and you keep checking the register R2. So, is R2, if it R2 is 1, you keep looping. If R2 is 0, you move ahead. So, if R2 is 1, branch if not equal to 0, R2 to try. So, keep trying and this is my try label. Okay? So, you are going to loop in this in your locally cached lock variable. So, this has saved invalidations which could have happened otherwise if we had already done exchange. So, I am not going to execute exchange right now. Once uh, I see that R2 is equal to 0, we try to exchange. So, I will try to set a 1 into the lock variable. So, R2 is anyway 0, that is why we have come to this line of the code. So, I want to make it 1 
So I'll simply say add 1 to the register 0 and write it in R2. So I'm doing R0 plus 1 going to R2. R0 has the value of 0 plus 1. So 0 plus 1, 1 goes into R2. So R2 has got the value of 1. Now I will do an exchange. So this value and the lock var. So these two, this goes here, this comes here. So that's the exchange I'm trying. Now at this is the fourth line where I am doing the write. So I'll do the exchange R2 with the lock var. Okay, so once I exchange, our uh, job is still not done because at the time of exchange, it could so happen that here, here I saw that the lock was free, right? And I started executing the ad. So when I was at this instruction, it is possible that there is some other process in the system which has already acquired the lock. Hence, it is necessary that I check again. Even after I finish the exchange, I need to check whether the lock was still free by this time. Okay, so I again need to check for the zero. So if it is not zero, if we are unlucky, maybe somebody else acquired the lock. So even here you check if branch if not equal to zero, keep looping again. Okay, so here we are going to spin on local copy. Spin on your local copy of the lock variable. Once you see that it is zero, you try to exchange it. So you want to try to write a one. You want to write a one into it. But while doing this, you have to again check whether the value was still zero because you came to the fourth line because it was zero. But in the meantime, it may not be zero. Hence, you need to check it again. Otherwise, keep looping. So a uh, neater code is written here. So this is for locking and once uh, you finish using, you have to release the lock by storing a zero into the lock variable. So this is very straightforward. You simply have to say st uh, lock var with zero. Okay, so you have to write the value of zero into that particular location. So spinning on a cached copy is uh, performance wise beneficial. Okay, now we look at the other instruction LL and SC, which is load linked and stored conditional. So spinning uh, was okay, that is we have, we were doing the read and uh, once the read said that the lock was free, we went to the third line and did an exchange. So exchange was again a write and after the exchange, I again checked whether the lock variable was still free by the fourth or fifth line of my program, okay, because in the meanwhile, somebody would have changed it. Okay, so this exchange which we did, it is again a write operation. And in a multi-core system, it is likely that if one process succeeds to do the exchange, there will be several who did not succeed. So these failed attempts of uh, exchanging, that is they tried to exchange and uh, saw that the lock was not available. So we want to avoid these exchanges of those processes which were failing in my previous scenario. Okay, so you do a loop on that, you check that the lock is free, so that is the read loop. After you see that the lock is free, you go to the exchange. But what I am saying is, I don't want to do the exchange every time. I want to do the exchange only if there is a chance of success. Okay, so the failed attempts of exchange are going to do unnecessary invalidations. So this problem was solved by this pair of instructions called load link and stored conditional. So load link is equivalent to the reading loop. Right? So I'm going to read uh, in a loop using the LL instruction and the exchange instruction in my previous slide will now be replaced by the store conditional instruction. How is this different? This is different because store conditional, though it is a store instruction, it only succeeds if the lock was available. That is, the, in the meanwhile, if some other process has already acquired the lock, then the store instruction will not execute. When the store instruction does not execute, it doesn't uh, lead to invalidations. Okay, so that's the beauty of this pair of instructions. Okay, so we are going to spin on the local copy and similar to what we did in the exchange. And when we try to exchange, it is going to generate several invalidations. The failed attempts of exchange are unnecessarily creating these many uh, invalidations. So the modern processors are using a pair of instruction, load linked and store conditional. The first instruction is a read. The second one is a conditional store instruction, which 
writes the modified value into the lock variable. And when does it write this? When does it write this? Only if other processors has not written to that location. If there was a processor which was uh, succeeded in writing to that location, then this store instruction will not execute. For example, here, here you derived that the lock was free, okay, third line. When you came to the fourth line, uh, you executed your fourth line and while doing this, you found that the lock was locked, okay. So, your exchange was wasteful. I want to stop this wasteful exchange and therefore, this exchange will be replaced by a store conditional. This instruction will only execute be given that nobody in the meantime has changed the lock variable. We will see implementation of this uh, in some other lecture, but right now you can assume that there is some mechanism which implements this. Now, when do I say my atomic exchange has completed? When both of them complete together, okay. So, they complete as a pair and not individually. The store conditional instruction whether it finishes or not uh, can be easily identified using the return values or condition codes. So, when you execute store conditional, see store instruction is different, store instruction simply goes and uh, modifies the value, whereas store conditional will only store given that nobody in the meanwhile has changed. So, we have LL and we have store conditional. In the meanwhile, if any process changes the variable, okay. So, I had the LL and then I do something in the middle and then we go to the store conditional. Between these two instructions, if any other process has updated the lock variable, then the store conditional instruction will not succeed. So, its return value will indicate accordingly. So, let us see how I can uh, do this exchange using LL and SC. So, I am again going to spin on my local cached copy and uh, but I am not going to use the exchange instruction, I am going to use the LL and SC instruction, okay. So, we were doing a read first, so read will be replaced by LL, so I am going to read the lock variable into the register R2, okay. So, read the lock variable into R2, what are you going to check whether R2 is 0 or not. If it is 0, you can move on. If it is 1, keep looping. So, branch if not equal to 0, so if R2 is not 0, you keep on trying. So, this is my try label, okay. So, keep going and trying to read the value. Once you see that R2 is 0, you have to write a 1 into it and then exchange that R2 and lock where. So, I am going to again do add uh, destination is R2 and R0 has value of 0 and this is a immediate value of 1. So, I am going to do 0 plus 1 and write it in the register R2. Once we do this, try the store that is earlier it was an exchange instruction, now I am writing store conditional. What am I storing? R2 in the lock where. So, R2 where I wrote the value of 1 and lock where is the variable. I want to write this exchange was exchanging the values. Here I am going to do a store conditional. It is not an exchange. So, store conditional will go and write a 1 into it provided the implementation says that nobody has changed the lock variable in the meantime. If somebody has changed that store conditional will fail, it will not do the lock and it will return the success or failure code into the R2 variable. So, R2 variable is going to bring the success or failure. So, here uh, in SC, if the return value is 0 means it has failed and if the return value is 1 means it has succeeded. So, if R2 value is 0 means it has failed, so I will check for 0. Branch if equal to 0, it was 0, I have failed this equal, um, failed the store conditional, what should we do? keep trying. So, you have to go back to try. And uh, here the first two is called the spinning. So, you keep spinning to check the value. Then you set R2 to 1 and then try to write, okay. So, you try to lock. 
when you try to lock in the meanwhile if somebody has already locked then you will get a failure code inside r2 and you will have to keep looping again so this is how uh, ll and sc as a pair can be used for doing this atomic exchange okay so oh, well we read that and keep spinning until the value is zero and once you get the value of zero you want to try to write but in case of multiple processors if everybody tries to uh, write a one one of them will succeed because in the meanwhile if the lock variable is changed by others my sc instruction will not succeed and why will this happen because when multiple processes execute this sc see sc is an instruction which will be executed by multiple if there are multiple processes trying to acquire a lock only one of them will go on to the bus or reach the directory get serialized and get access to that lock variable so the process which succeeds will complete the write and the other processes will continue to retry so they'll keep retrying that is continue in this loop uh, until they get the lock so ll and sc they succeed as a pair okay they don't succeed alone they succeed as a pair uh, because only when both of them uh, execute correctly we are successful in acquiring the lock right so i hope it was uh, clear it's a very interesting combination of these two instructions we will see how does the sc return a failure or a success code in uh, some other lecture okay so this pair helps me to do the exchange now what should be there between these two pairs because we say that these two instructions together establish the task of atomic thing so when i have two instructions how many instructions should i write between them okay so i had a ll instruction here and uh, this ll then there were few more instructions and then we wrote the sc instruction can i write 10 instructions here can i write 100 instructions between them because you're saying well they both will succeed as a pair and should i really bother how much work i do between those two instructions okay so we need to understand that eventually i want to acquire the lock so i should not waste the time between these two instructions doing uh, something which is not right now required again if sc fails right sequen uh, your store uh, conditional instruction if it fails we keep on trying again so between ll and sc whatever work you did will get wiped off right it is not going to be useful so therefore it is advised that you should not change your program variables between these two between ll and sc don't change important variables you only do the work which is most necessary so between these two instructions what are you going to do you only change the variable which you are going to use to uh, establish the lock you don't change your data or program variables inside this loop because if it fails and i keep looping that changes will be uh, there but may affect the correctness of the program okay so overall what all instructions should you write between them definitely there has to be very few instructions because eventually you want to execute the sequential sorry because eventually you want to execute the store conditional the intermediate instructions are not guaranteed to be done atomically because they will be easily interleaved so i have ll sc 1 2 3 instructions then i have another process which is also doing ll sc few more instructions so these intermediate instructions they will again get interleaved so it is not guaranteed that these uh, middle instructions will happen all together no they will get interleaved and therefore i can't say that this middle part is a critical section so this is not a critical section your critical section will begin only after you acquire a lock this part of the code is to acquire the lock okay so these uh, middle instructions they get interleaved across different processes and they do not constitute a critical section in case your store conditional fails then all these intermediate instructions uh, if they get executed at all they should not affect the correctness of the performance because uh, correctness of the program because if you are say writing an instruction which increments suppose i wrote a++ which was one of my program variables every attempt of this loop is going to keep on incrementing your a variable which is going to affect the correctness of your program so do not use or change program variables inside this loop okay don't make major changes in this segment do a small set of work 
only do uh, changes to the register which you are going to use during the sequential uh, which you are going to use during the store conditional let them be simple register operations try to avoid memory operations because if you have a memory operation it is going to add further delays and your gap between the ll and the sc is going to increase Okay, so keep the number of instructions small so that eventually you should get a chance to execute your store conditional. So, uh, so that is the concept of LL and SC. We will now see two examples of how to do atomic swap and another type of an instruction using LL and SC. Okay. So, what we are going to do? I have a register R4 and R1 has got an address of the memory and we want to do this atomic swap okay, similar to an exchange. So, these are some additional examples so that you understand the concept of doing the same thing using LLSC. Okay. So, we want to do this exchange R1 is actually the lock variable R1 is storing the address of the lock variable. So, what I will do I will first try to read it using LL. So, LL says you read this R2. So, if I say 0 R1, it means R1's contents, which is the address, any offset I want to add to it. So, this is the memory address and this is the destination register. Okay, So, that is the destination register. So, load from that lock variable into R2. Now, you want to write a 1 or R4 should go there. So, I will do a store conditional. I will store inside this. What will I store? I will store the value of R4. Okay, So, I will store R4 inside this store conditional. Back to back both of them is okay. Once I do store conditional, SC is going to send a return value of failure or success. Okay, So, failure will return a 0, success will return a 1 and where will this value come? it will come in my register which I have right now given as R4. So, this success of failure value will come in R4 and it is going to overwrite the value I intended to use. So, this is creating a problem hence before I use R4 with this I need to make a copy or keep a copy of that. So, I am going to make some change to this and I am going to keep a copy of R4 in the register R3 as a temporary variable. So, make a copy of R4 and R3, then execute this. Now, I can safely use R3 here because let me use R3 as a temporary scratch pad variable. R4 retains the original value I am interested in. After SC, you are going to get the success code of R3 and if R3 is uh, 0, that is it has failed, you have to keep on looping. So, where should your loop start? loop should start here at the first line and we will say branch if equal to 0. If R3 is equal to 0, branch to the label try and keep on looping. Once you succeed this, you want to again regain uh, your value which you have done the exchange. So, the lock variables value came in R2, right? you did the loading here. So, this R2's value should get copied to R4 because store conditional is going to move R4 to lock variable. So, this is how we can implement the atomic swap using LLSC instruction pair. Okay. The first instruction of moving this value, this instruction is actually used to keep the R4 intact because SC is going to change this destination register that R3 will get changed with the success or failure code and I would lose my value of R4. Hence, I first try to store R4 and uh, in R3 and R3 is used as a temporary variable. So, every time I loop, I make a fresh copy of R4 inside R3 and use R3 for store conditional instruction. Okay. Let us do the next one using fetch and increment. Now, fetch and increment says go read the value and add 1 to it. Uh, suppose I have a lock where this lock where's address is given in R1. So, I can use, um, I am just using different types of instructions to give more flavors to the uh, idea. So, R1 is storing the address and our idea is fetch an increment. So, you want to bring this value 
do a plus one and then write the value back okay so this is what we want to do okay so let us first read the value so this is my lock variable i'm going to do a load linked zero of r1 that is contents of the memory location pointed to by register r1 and read the value inside register r2 whatever is this value i want to do a plus one in the previous case we wrote a one inside that in the fetch and increment i'm going to add a one to that value so i need to add a value to this so i will use an assembly instruction to add one to r2 so i'm going to do r2 plus one and let that answer come in r3 so r3 is the destination so r3 is equal to r2 plus one now this r3 i am going to write inside the lock variable using store conditional so store conditional write r3 in the lock variable lock variable is zero of r1 that is address is given in the register r1 once you do this what happens success or failure code will come in r3 if r3 is zero failed if r3 is one success so if we have failed we have to keep trying so i need the try label here and i will say branch if equal to zero that is if we have failed if r3 is equal to zero go and try again okay so branch if equal to zero keep trying okay so here r3 will be zero for a failure and r3 will be one for a success this is saying r3 is equal to value of r2 plus one because we are doing fetch and increment okay yeah so the same code is written here so first you do the load linked increment the value attempt store conditional success move on failure then keep on looping okay so this is how i can use ll and sc for fetch and increment so we tried a variety of options atomic exchange exchange instruction and fetch and increment using the same combination so your hardware could be providing you an atomic uh, compare and swap type of an instruction or if it provides ll and sc you will be able to use them to do the same task okay so ll and sc is a more generic type of a pair of instructions to acquire the lock Okay, so with this, uh, we've got a feel of what are the these uninterruptible instructions. So we stop this lecture here. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.